to join, right? Yes, and I don't have uh, Anish uh, CV. Uh, I've sent it to you. I've sent it. So, so let me uh, call him once again. Hello. Yeah. सबसे पहले मैं यहाँ रखती हूँ मैं भाग जाती हूँ जिससे कुछ पूछ रहा हूँ बाकी मिल जाऊंगी Yeah. So, uh, so Dr. Jaisal, I think I'll we'll start with the program. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, a very warm welcome to all the viewers for this uh, continuing nursing education program, which we conduct every fortnightly for the academics of nurses, and uh, which and also train them in academics, and uh, because they are the key pillars in the any uh, successful running of any NICU. So today is also a special occasion because uh, we have uh, National Newborn Care Week going on and we had a World Prematurity Day yesterday. Uh, so this right now, so it's a, a right time to talk about these neonatal topics. So today we have two interesting neonatal topics. One is blood component therapy, uh, which uh, Dr. Om Prakash uh, will be talking about. He'll be joining in a short while. And then we also... We also have today with us uh, Dr. Asmita Mahajan, who will be talking about management of newborn who has birth asphyxia with little bit of hypothermia treatment uh, from nursing perspective. Uh, so with this introduction, I'll ask Dr. Jaisal Seth, who is the chairperson of CNE program, to introduce our uh, expert for today, Dr. Anish Pillai, and the speakers for today. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. We welcome all of you, all the participants who have joined today, because without participation, these changes are really not very kind of productive. Uh, we welcome uh, Dr. Anish Pillai. Dr. Anish Pillai is a uh, practicing DM neonatologist at Surya Children Hospital, Mumbai. He has done his uh, uh, DM, followed by his training from uh, Canada, Vancouver. So welcome, Dr. Anish. Uh, another two speakers are my... Dr. Uh, um, Om Prakash uh, uh, is there. Dr. Om Prakash Bhimadar is practicing as a uh, um, consultant neonatologist at Apollo Children Hospital, Navi Mumbai. He is a student from the uh, KM Hospital, Mumbai, followed by that. He has done his RCA degree from Mumbai, uh, sorry, from London. And after that, uh, he has worked in multiple places. He is a very, very passionate uh, NRP um, uh, instructor and uh, he, he, he is a very good teacher. Uh, so welcome Dr. Uh, Om Prakash and uh, Dr. Ashmita Majan, uh, a very uh, dear friend. Dr. Ashmita Majan yeah. is a 
practicing consultant, senior neonatologist at uh, Fortis Hospital, Rahecha, Mumbai. Uh, the, both the topics are very, very interesting. Uh, blood products uh, administration, because that is what nurses do daily in and out. And the other is birth asphyxia management, nursing care plan. Uh, because without the understanding of the nurse, uh, you know, it is very difficult to manage this kind of the special uh, treatment for uh, birth asphyxia. So uh, with that note, uh, I actually uh, request uh, Dr. Anish to moderate the session because I have a one LSCS where I will be like a little in and out, but uh, I will try to be present uh, as much as possible. Uh, so Dr. Om Prakash, uh, are you ready to uh, start your presentation? I think Om Prakash has yet not joined. Oh, yeah. no. I think he's having some trouble joining in. Okay. Uh, so let me just uh, check with him. I can see him joining. Yeah, yeah, you can see him now. Yeah. I, I, I think there was some issue with my uh, Zoom one second. I just completed your introduction. That's one of the very famous, very passionate in our instructor, excellent consultant and the soft-spoken dearest friend. Welcome, Dr. Om Prakash. Sorry for the delay. Some equipment issues were there. So it took some time for me to get into the system. No problem. All yours. Yes. So, uh, I'll just share my screen. Is it uh, visible to all? Yes, we can see the slides. Yes, I'm just starting the slideshow part of it. Uh, I'm going to rotate a bit so that this are the slides uh, clear and visible and I'm also able to all I hope. Yes, it's visible. Yes. So, we are, um, good afternoon, good evening all. So, we are going to talk about blood products in NSU. It is slightly difficult to make the interactive sessions on online because, you know, uh, there will be some interface barrier will be there. And first of all, sorry for starting uh, uh, delayed because of the connectivity issues that I was facing. So what we are going to talk about is the blood products that we use in NICU setting. So here we discuss a bit about uh, what is the problem that we face when we think about the transfusions in the newborn babies, how the transfusions in newborns are different than the one in the children, and what are the different products that we use. Next is when we should think of transfusions, what are the things to be taken care of, and what are the side effects, and how we are going to minimize the use of these trans transfusions that we see in us. So, first of all, let in terms like so most of the time, 60% of the transfusion during their stay in the NS. 60% of very low birth weight also, also, they do get blood transfusion during their stay in the NS. We do call anemia of prematurity for most of these babies when we say indication of transfusion. But to keep in mind for all of you, it is, I will say, AOP is not anemia of prematurity, but it is anemia of phlebotomy loss. And this phlebotomy loss is all of us in the rounds ask for, you know, do this sample, do that sample. From day one of life to day, you know, till the time the baby is there with us, we do so many varieties of blood tests, growing bloods, this, that. 
and then we push the babies into this anemia of you know not prematurity but phlebotomy loss so this is the major contributing factor for the transfusions in the babies can the audience give some answers if i you know uh, i expect them to interact with me is it possible um, actually uh, everyone is on mute okay. so no problem the yeah. audio yeah. is Can the chat the box, box. You can uh, they can write it in the chat box. That's right. That's right. So that that is fine there. So uh, because we... Adam Kumar, we have only eleven participants on the Zoom. Rest will be on YouTube, and many that's of them right. view right. them later on the YouTube also. Yes. So overall yes. viewership is two hundred to three hundred, but right now there may not be many to answer. No problem. No. So let's try to understand. how it is different in the newborn babies transfusion and children and adult is again totally different area so see in newborn babies babies they do get blood from the mother's circulation okay and as a result of that there are certain antibodies which are in relation to the red cells in relation to the other cells that the baby get from mother they are sensitized so it is important whenever we think of transfusion we need to take into consideration mother's blood group along with the blood Group of the baby, so that's the reason we take one sample of baby and one sample of mother because there is sensitization of baby that happens when baby is in the mother's womb. Then second is the organ system in the babies are still developing, so there is a high risk of metabolic complications. There is a high risk of infections, immunological reactions like transmission related reactions that we see in children and adults. And the third component is hemodynamic instability. So if you recollect. What is the volume of blood that babies are having? So it is like 80 to 100 ml per kg, and that much volume is very small volume for a baby who is one kg. So a one kg baby maybe has just 80 to 100 ml of blood, and that is the reason I was saying that the phlebotomy loss. If you are taking 10 10 ml of blood, so that is a significant loss of blood for that baby. So all these components make. that babies are more fragile when we are thinking about transfusion in comparison to children and adults i hope everyone is in tune in terms of the language if there are difficulties you can please put in the chat box and i can try to explain in hindi or marathi if the sisters are looking for that so what are the blood products that we use so the red blood cells the ffp that is fresh frozen plasma platelets cryoprecipitates and albumin these are the blood products that we use so we are going to focus more on the initial three which we use commonly in our nicu settings so first of all let's try to understand when do we think of giving blood products by one by one so the red blood cells we think of giving to the baby when the baby is having low hemoglobin and baby is having some symptoms of low hemoglobin so let's try to understand what are the causes of this low hemoglobin so hemoglobin is very important because it carries oxygen to all over body and that indirectly prevents lot many complications so if the hemoglobin is low then the babies will will be in a state of hypoxia their oxygen carrying capacity is decreased so the oxygen levels are decreased the heart has to pump extra there is increase in the heart rate they do manifest other signs sometimes like not gaining weight and all that things okay so let's try to understand what are the causes of low hemoglobin so hemoglobin low immediately after birth that means there is some reason maybe at the level of the placenta there is placental abruption or placenta previa or there is some trauma at the level of placenta causing loss of blood from the baby or something called as a fetal maternal or fetal placental blood loss where the blood when it is baby is delivered out because of maybe some positional difficulties like the baby's position is on a higher level than the placenta and mother's level the blood can go backwards okay that is one of the contributing factor then second is twin to twin transfusion particularly if it is a mono amniotic mono chorionic situation some blood vessels will be overlapping between the two babies and these babies one acts as a donor and one acts as a recipient the donor baby will lose blood and then the recipient will be receiving extra blood and there will be complications in relation to both to that to both of them then there may be some bleeding 
maybe in the brain, maybe in the abdomen, which may be concealed for us to identify. The particularly if the baby is mutation, in that situation, we need to be very careful because there were a high chances of intracranial duress. And iatrogenic blood loss, I'm going to insist a lot on this because we need to think before we collect any sample. And as a practice, I will suggest all of you, for all babies who are coming to your NICU, particularly babies who are extremely low birth weight, extremely preterm babies, make a habit of maintaining a phlebotomy chart where we know how much sample we have taken for the baby. And we need to think that we should not use a big, big containers. I know pediatric and adults, big containers are fine. We should use a small micro containers. I will say just point one or 0.2 ml of blood is enough for a blood gas rather than taking a 1 ml or 2 ml of blood for blood gas. Okay, And same for doing CBCs and CRP. So use a small containers and we are very meticulous. In fact, many times for blood gases, what we do is bedside capillaries. capillaries. So that also helps to prevent the excessive blood that we take for taking sample, for doing different samples that we do in our day-to-day -day practices in NICU. So this has to be very important and this has to be taken care of. There may be problem with the destruction of red blood cells or there may be problem with the production of hemoglobin. So destruction may be because of blood group differences. You must have heard of this baby car blood group RH positive, baby car and mother is RH negative in that case, or there may be ABO blood group. Certain infections also do contribute for blood loss. You know? And then if there is problem with the production of red cells like a plastic or hypoplastic anemia, that can also cause low hemoglobin. So after understanding the cause of low hemoglobin, then we decide we need to think about blood transfusion for the baby. So there are two thoughts about this blood transfusion. Some people think that give, give red cells liberally. And some people think give it very restrictively. So there are different pros and cons. As far as literature is concerned, the restricted transfusion is still preferred in most of the NICUs where we wait for the hemoglobin to fall in the range of seven to eight. And the liberal, they give the transfusion, even the hemoglobin is in the range of nine to 10. So why do we prefer restricted transfusion? Because the less number of transfusions and less number of exposure of the baby to different blood products. you should have policies in your unit. So this is a good flow chart that may help you to decide whether there is a need of transfusion for the baby or not. So depending on the, just the week of the life, you know, if it is a first week of life, babies having some respiratory support, that means requiring some oxygen, requiring PEEP to maintain the lungs open. So in that situation, they are in a dependent situation. So here we want to keep a hemoglobin on a higher side. So for these babies, we want a hemoglobin, the transfusion to be done, even their hemoglobin is in the range of 11.5. But the first week life not requiring support and hemoglobin is in 10, in that situation also we need to think of giving blood product because here we want to improve the oxygenation. And if your oxygenation is not very well, there is a high risk of periventricular leukomalacias in the first week of life. So that is the reason we need to be careful when the hemoglobin is in the range of 10 and baby is still not requiring support. In the second week of life, our thresholds will further decrease, you know, decrease in the terms of the hemoglobin levels are in the range of 10. If baby is requiring support, we think of transfusion and if baby is not requiring support and hemoglobin in the, is in the range of 8.5, we think of the transfusion. And in the third week and further onwards, if baby is still requiring support and hemoglobin is in the range of 8.5, we should think of transfusion. And if baby is not requiring any support, if the hemoglobin is in the range of 7.5, we should think of transfusion. So now if you see, from to third week, the first week we want hemoglobin on a higher side. On the third week, we want we are on one week of brain and all. So, and the second is we want the babies to produce their own hemoglobin. And that will happen when the hemoglobin is low, there is something called as erythropoietin in the body that gets stimulated and that helps to promote the production of red cells. 
But if you give blood from the outside, the hemoglobin levels are up, then automatically the sensors won't get sensitized for the low hemoglobin and they don't produce erythropoietin adrenal level. So the, in the baby's production of red blood cell is also getting on a lower side. So here, what we are trying to understand is as the baby's age progresses, we are fine with the lower hemoglobin because we want endogenous production of red cell. Provided babies growing well, provided babies not showing signs and symptoms of congestive cardiac failure because of the low hemoglobin. So this is a very informative chart that all of you should keep in mind. I would like to ask, you can put in the chat box, what is this procedure? I'm sure some of you who are working in different parts of Maharashtra, you must have seen this procedure. What is this happening here? This umbilical catheter in place, there are two, three ways, and there are two you know, extensions going downward from the baby, and uh, we can see blood filled in the series. Can anyone put in the chat box? Any answer or no response so far? If there is some response, that means people are listening attentively. If there is no response, that means they have just started for the sake of starting and they are rooming here and there. So for the benefit of time, I'm going to proceed. So this is called as a extensed transfusion, where on one side, we are going to remove some blood from the baby. And on the other side, we are going to push fresh blood in the baby. So the reason for doing this is baby is having hyperglobulinemia. Sometimes we do this procedure for babies who have bad sepsis also. So here, this slight difference than the routine blood transfusion that we give and for babies who are having uh, exchange transfusion, we need to be doubly careful because we are giving extra volume of blood in this situation. So we prefer ORH negative blood. We make sure it is CMV negative, liquid reduced blood, and it should be fresh, less than five days preferably. And our hematocrit should be away that how much we are giving to the baby. It has to be irradiated, preferably used within 24 hours of irradiation. Why we do all this, we are going to discuss further when we look at the complications and risks associated with transfusion. Now, how much is enough in terms of the volume of blood that we want to give to the baby? Generally, we give 10 to 15 ml per kg. Some units, they give up to 20 ml per kg. It has to be used within four hours once you open the bag. When we give transfusion, we need to look at the vital parameters very closely. We need to look at the sugars and make sure there is no any hypoglycemia for the baby. And after giving transfusion, what do you expect? We do check hemoglobin after 24 to 48 hours and we do expect some rise of two to three grams per liter. This is something called as a multiple aliquots or making small bags from a bigger bag. So what we get in from the, the uh, the, the, the lab is like 300, 400 ml of blood. So before you receive it from the blood bank, you should inform them that don't give us 300 ml of blood. Our baby is only one kg. We are planning for 15 to 20 ml of blood for this baby. So if you give 300 ml, we are going to waste rest of the things. So for that, we can ask them to make into small aliquots, some people call it as a satellite packs, where they convert it into maybe 50 ml packs or 40 ml packs. And this we can use in case a baby requires subsequent transfusion. So this will help to decrease the loss of the wastage of the blood. This will help to decrease the exposure of the baby to multiple blood products from different people. And this also will help to decrease the reactions in relation to the multiple exposure to blood products. So this is very important. And this, I think if you are not doing it, make sure you communicate with your blood bank and then ask them to do this for particularly smaller babies. What do you check before giving transfusion? Again, I wanted to put forward this question to all of you. So let's see what, what you will be checking before you transfuse to the baby, start transfusion to the baby. You can put in the chat box.
any answers you can please share so one participant has written blood group very good yes what else any reaction very right so whenever we ask for blood we do same mothers and babies blood group we need to confirm the same when we receive the bag from the blood bank they do mention the blood group of baby blood group of mother and accordingly what blood they have sent for us then look at the dates that are mentioned on the blood bag and make sure the name of the baby the uhid or any identification number of the baby is appropriately done so it's better to be done by two people because particularly in a busy unit where there are multiple transfusions multiple procedures are happening if there is slight mistake in this then i'm sure the baby may not be there subsequently so be careful before you start transfusion for the baby once you receive back bring it down to the room temperature maybe in half hour time and then try to finish it within 4 hours once you open it so that again the complications related to the transfusion will be minimized by this so what are the complications that is very important thing that we need to understand as i said baby systems are organ systems are not natural so during the process of transfusion there is a high risk of low sugars for them high risk of higher values of potassium hyperkalemia what we say and there is a high risk of low calcium that is hypocalcemia so need to be careful when we are doing transfusion that we monitor the blood sugar particularly when we are thinking of doing exchange transfusion there are certain components that are used for storing the blood the cytate and all that thing that can contribute for hypocalcemia the lysis of red cells while storage can will contribute a lot for hyperkalemia also as well as metabolic acidosis is known component so we need to monitor for all these components second is immunological reaction see we are giving blood to a baby whose immune system is getting mature and baby has got Uh, different cells from mother also so there is going to be some reaction in relation to the transfusion it may be as bad as there may be just lysis of the cells it is a hemolytic transfusion reaction or it may be a simple reaction like a fever or something like that or it may be transfusion related lung injuries or transfusion uh, t antigen activation and graft versus host reactions or disease so all these things we need to monitor and this will be reflected by looking at the moni the monitoring parameters the vital parameters that we look at the babies and color of urine also help whether there is any re reaction like a hemolytic transfusion reaction is there or not so this is the immunological complication next important thing is the infections contributed by the, due to the transfusions we do screen for you know conditions like hbcg hiv and all that things but certain viruses may not be picked they may be in a stage of latency so there is still higher risk of transmission related infection particularly in preterm babies i want to mention about the cme infection because if there is a cme infection to the babies there is a higher chances of sensory neural deficit and all the complications related to the cme infection in the small preterm babies and next is transmission related adverse outcomes so they, they may not be the immediate effect of transmission but the transfusion the process of transfusion does contribute for oxidative stress does contribute for changes in the gut in the, the intestinal blood circulation and increases the risk of necrotizing enterocolitis bronchopulmonary dysplasia intraventricular hemorrhage and retinopathy of prematurity so these are the additional things that we need to be think careful about so we should avoid the transfusions as much as possible now how to decrease the risk that is very important first of all as i said we need to cross check everything before we start transfusion for the baby that is one thing that we do bedside there another components that are should be taken care at the level of the blood bank is leukocyte reduction so there are certain filters available which help to decrease the leukocytes in the blood and as a result of this this decreases the febrile non hemolytic reactions 
as well as the allergic reactions and aluminization of the babies so this is very important and most of the places they do practice this leukocyte reduction this will also help a lot for preventing the cmv in patient that i described earlier also next is irradiation of blood products this will help to decrease the transfusion associated host versus host reactions and this is more important those who are immunocompromised and just to keep in mind all our preterm extremely preterm babies are immunocompromised so we should make sure that we are thinking of giving irradiated blood for them irradiated rbc is like this so you should use this blood within 28 days of use irradiated so this is all about red blood transfusion that we do in our nic practices next what we use many times is the platelet transfusions so what are the causes of having low platelets it may be effect of the maternal itp it may be because of the lack of production of platelet in the baby's body or it may be because of the infections so these are the common contributing factors for the low platelets babies who are iugr they are another subset of babies where we can low platelet come and as we see in case of abo rh incompatibility there is similar condition which can also contribute for low platelets in the babies now when to think of platelet transfusion there are different opinions there are no fixed values but based on the available information clinical experience and expert opinion there are certain values that we look forward whenever we think of platelet transfusion the blood tra blood prbc and platelet there will be slight difference so if you see prbc we do send mothers and babies blood group in our unit many times you know we do send that in when in that situation for platelet demanding platelet but platelets they don't require a group and cross match that we require for prbc transfusion so threshold for transfusion if your platelet count is less than 30000 there is likely possibility of ivs particularly in a high risk babies like a extreme preterm babies so we should think of transfusion for these babies and for that sake if babies platelet count is less than 50% with previous ivh or clinical instability in that situation we shouldn't wait for platelet to drop further you know because these are babies at higher risk of developing ivh and bleeding at different sites so in that situation even the platelet count is 50000 we should think of giving platelet so platelets they are available in the volume of 40 to 60 ml they are they should be also liquid reduced and irradiated how much volume of platelet we should give that is another thing we give 10 ml per kg another thing what we need to be you know careful when we think of platelet transfusion like platelet tend to settle and even in the you know if you check in the blood bank they have got agitated to you know keep platelet you know moving a bit so after receiving platelets it is good habit to you know shake shake them and then that will help to prevent stagnation of the platelets and then you give the platelet transfusion to the baby so here you can see the platelet it is different the red rbc we can identify easily but platelets are small bags and here they have not mentioned the blood group very bold here so that is like different that we can see in comparison to the fap that we i am going to show you subsequently so now next is about fresh frozen plasma so fresh frozen plasma is going to help us to improve the coagulation for the babies so babies who have got a deranged pta purity should we give fap that is a one major question so i will say many of this small preterm babies may have got a some derangement of the pta purity and for that what we do do you remember what what do we do to prevent this problem in relation to the coagulation any of you can put your answer how do you take precautions or prevent this coagulation problems in the newborn babies i am sure all of you are doing this in your day in and day out practices what do we give to the baby any answers
Hello, hello, Doctor Om Prakash. Uh, we cannot hear you. Uh, Doctor Om Prakash. I think there seems to be a technical error, so I think he'll join back. Hello. Yes. I think you got disconnected. I just share my screen. So, meanwhile, if you have any question or concern related to this topic, you please put in the chat box because uh, we will be having very little time to actually answer questions. So FAP transfusion, as I said, if there is coagulation difficulties associated with that, uh, that's transfusion. So, there will be slides remaining at the end. Uh, is it visible? Uh, yes. Hello, Dr. Amkar, uh, we are uh, not able to hear you and we, we need uh, to switch to uh, next talk actually. Uh, so should we start the next talk or should we yeah. wait for Dr. Om Prakash to join again? Uh, Dr. Anish, would you like to summarize uh, yeah. the point? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Sure. I'll so so for all the audience, I think uh, the presentation mainly highlighted on a few things. So we should for premature babies, small babies, uh, phlebotomy losses are very important. So it's a good habit to you know for making a chart that we have drawn 0.5 ml on this date. 0.3 ml because by the time it is one week you will notice that they have already had a 10 to 12 ml per kilo of blood loss lot of sick babies need sampling two times a day three times a day so that is number one as a take-home message secondly using restrictive guidelines that is which means that not transfusing you know at a very high hemoglobin level and using satellite bags so making that 300 ml bag into three or four small bags so that the donor exposures are limited so these two strategies are good Checking or rather double checking the baby's blood group, 
for cross match it is extremely important in the first 2 um, 3 months to cross match the blood sample with the baby's blood group and the mother's blood so the, the baby has to the blood which are which being transfused has to be double cross match because remember that the baby's uh, mother's blood also circulates in the baby circulation for the initial period so if the mother is a baby is o or vice versa you can only give an o positive prbc because it has to be cross match with both one compatible with both the baby's and mother's blood group from the nursing perspective whenever there is a transfusion on take care of the iv line monitor vitals heart rate color spo2 blood pressure sugar monitoring is important that can go either higher or lower and certain things like electrolytes post transfusion need to be monitored and urine output so from prbc perspective these are the main points platelets again we are not transfusing very early so less than 30000 or even 25000 in a baby who is not bleeding is our usual current threshold based on the recent planet 2 trial and if there is a procedure invasive procedure or if the baby is sick then up to 50000 you can transfuse uh ffp again the use has been limited with giving vitamin k at birth to all infants has uh, reduced the ffp use and secondly pt aptt values in premature babies are different the normal normal values are different than what we take for adults so just routinely doing a pt aptt and if your aptt is 35 giving a transfusion or if your inr is 1.2 is not Uh, evidence-based practice. So there should be any clinical evidence of coagulopathy. Plus there should be a, a need for FFP. So I think with this we can wrap up the first session. Uh, we can welcome Dr. Asmita for the next session. Thank you, Dr. Anish. Uh, I would first like to start by thanking Maharashtra NNF, Dr. Ashish Dohade, Dr. Jaisal. Thanks a ton for having me here. and it gives me immense pleasure to participate in this continuing nursing education nurses being the pillar of our nicu i think their education is the top most priority we all should have as neonatologists so without further ado i would like to start with the screen sharing give me a second is it visible yes okay good evening all my topic for the day today is management of the asphyxiated neonate we all know that perinatal asphyxia is a very common neonatal problem nearly 1.5% of the live births may have some form of asphyxia which we are going to learn in short about today this contributes significantly to neonatal morbidity and mortality and it is the second most important cause of neonatal death as of now it accounts for nearly one fourth that is 25% of the neonatal deaths so what is asphyxia it is an insert which happens to the fetus or to the immediate newborn period baby in the sense that there is a lack of oxygen which is called hypoxia there is a lack of perfusion or blood supply or blood circulation called as ischemia and there is a lack of gas exchange which leads to asphyxia everything leading to tissue injury you may have heard doctor saying that this baby appears to be depressed so what is neonatal depression what does this terminology mean it means depressed mental status of the baby a uh, depressed or decreased muscle tone and plus may or may not have cardio respiratory disturbance which is there in the immediate newborn period that is the first 1 hour after life after the first 1 hour of life the similar findings contribute to what we call as neonatal encephalopathy so you must have all heard about hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy so what is it hypoxia and ischemia we already learned what it means right so a lack of oxygen a lack of blood flow to the brain will cause what is called as resultant brain damage or encephalopathy it is described as about with the evidence supported by neuroimaging or with biochemical evidence of hypoxia as well as ischemia usually in short if you would like to summarize it is usually there if the first or the cord blood gas as a ph of less than 7.0 or a base deficit of more than or equal to 12 to 16 millimoles per liter 
there can be some signs and symptoms before a delivery of a baby which can also point to possible hie or possible perinatal asphyxia so what can be the signs before delivery so there may be decreased fetal movements severe maternal cramping history vaginal bleeding that is antepartum hemorrhage abnormal heart rate of the mother or fetal heart rate abnormal maternal weight gain throughout pregnancy or maternal high blood pressure these would be i would say risk factors for hie or perinatal asphyxia the birth and infancy or later sequelae we will be going through in the uh, subsequent slides we should all know in brief about something called as sarnat and sarnat staging or classification of neonatal hi it is uh, classified into grade 1 or stage 1 2 and 3 depending on the level of consciousness of the baby as shown by the activity that is the neuromuscular control the muscle tone of the baby the posture of the baby which i'll try to show you in a picture and the baby's reflexes plus complex neonatal reflexes like sup moros and a tonic neck reflex are also checked in such babies and certain subtle signs like autonomic nervous system signs like the pupillary response the heart rate the respiratory rate also are looked into accordingly the baby is graded and of course the presence of seizures or absence of seizures also shows us whether the baby goes into stage 2 or stage 3 generally stage 1 will have no seizures stage 2 will have very commonly seizures and again stage 3 which is very much obtended baby again or comatose uh, kind of baby unconscious they will not have seizures commonly so this will be the staging of the hiv which will help us to prognosticate the baby to tell us the prognosis or the outcome of the or predict the outcome of the baby so just remember that asphyxia is likely if antenatally acidosis has been proven by doing a blood gas and the acidosis has been there for more than 1 hour or there is a history of fetal heart rate which is less than 60 beats per minute or the apgar scoring of the baby is less than 3 at the end of 10 minutes or there is a need for positive pressure ventilation which lasts for nearly more than 5 minutes or a delayed cry which is more than 5 minutes later seizures presenting within the first 12 to 24 hours after birth and finally an abnormal eeg showing either birth suppression pattern or isoelectric or suppressed background so these will all point to that there was some perinatal asphyxia which happened to the baby so there are so many definitions we come by about asphyxia who just says that it's a failure to initiate and sustain the breathing at birth whereas nnf classifies it into mild moderate severe depending on an apgar score moderate asphyxia is an apgar score of 4 to 6 at 1 minute of age whereas severe asphyxia is a score of 0 to 3 at 1 minute of age a brief recount of the etiology or causes of these asphyxias there may be intrapartum or antepartum causes that is before the birth of the baby or during the delivery for example something causing a uh, placental insufficiency like a chronic maternal diabetes or blood pressure then there may be cord prolapse cord compression abruption or a uterine rupture also which can cause asphyxia fetal causes like fetal anemia high drops or other cardiopulmonary compromise and of course post delivery if the baby has any respiratory or cardiac problems that those babies can also have perinatal asphyxia remember a few very important risk factors which should be like a red flag sign in your mind that this baby is likely to have asphyxia so they are either that the mother has diabetes or pih the baby has uh, you know the antenatal sonographies are showing that the baby is likely to be an iugr baby or a breech or abnormal presentation baby or a very big size baby which you know can get stuck during the labor and post dated babies also because they are more likely to have meconium stained amniotic fluid briefly let us recount what are the signs and symptoms you should know about a baby with birth asphyxia or perinatal asphyxia so the first and foremost signs and symptoms will be related to obviously the brain there will be hie which in turn implies that there will be altered sensorium 
may or may not have irritability, lethargy, or sometimes even deeply comatose baby. There will be tone disturbances, usually a hypotonia of the proximal girdle muscles. So the baby is just lying limp or a floppy or pithed frog-like posture. There will be lack of head control if you try to lift up the baby uh, with the, you know, holding with the shoulders or the arms and weakness of the shoulder muscles also in babies. Plus autonomic changes like hypotension, increased salivation or frothing at the mouth, too much salivation is there, abnormal pupillary responses are known. Plus abnormal brainstem reflexes, cranial nerve involvement sometimes may also happen. Neonatal reflexes are altered like the morose sucking reflex is depressed, swallowing reflex is depressed. So there is more pooling of secretions in the throat and the mouth. So the baby needs a suction again and again. Of course, seizures or fits are a very common complication of asphyxia. And sometimes the baby may show signs of increased ICP or intracranial pressure also. So this, uh, you know, picture just sort of summarizes everything. Activity is decreased. The posture sometimes, the distal flexion and all is affected. Tone may be sometimes increased also. Or in severe cases, it may be decreased tone, that is floppy baby. Reflexes, the weak suck is there, partial morose reflex may be present. And autonomic changes like tachycardia more than 160 uh, beats per minute, a breath rate of more than 60, that is tachypnea. And sometimes pupillary dilatation is common. Stage 1 baby, HIE, may be even hyper alert or just staring look or jittery uh, jitteriness is very common. So remember that a baby may not always appear depressed, but a hyper alert baby may also be sometimes abnormal. Of course, complications like multi-organ dysfunctions have to be kept in mind. It is not only the brain which is affected, but the heart as well. So myocardial dysfunction is common because of hypoxia, which leads in turn to hypotension and congestive heart failure. Lungs may show PPHN, that is persistent pulmonary hypertension. Sometimes if the baby is born through meconium, there may be aspiration syndrome, that is meconium-related pneumonia and other changes. Pulmonary hemorrhage and edema are also common. The kidneys are affected in turn because of reduced blood supply to the kidneys, causing sometimes acute renal failure. Uh, other complications like hematological complications, DIC, liver dysfunction, poor platelet production by the bone marrow are also known. The gastrointestinal tract, there may be bowel ischemia, again because of poor bowel or gut blood supply, plus which in turn leads to feed intolerance and in severe cases even NEC. So, by summarizing all this, I just wanted to give you all an overview of perinatal or birth asphyxia. Now, coming to our main topic of the day, that is the management of the asphyxiated neuron. So, I'm going to focus a bit on therapeutic hypotherm hypothermia more, okay, because you need to know uh, about it as a relatively new topic, but now well established. So let's start with the basic management first. First of all, you know that this is an asphyxiated baby or you suspect it's an asphyxiated baby. We have to try and prevent further organ damage to the baby. So we have to maintain oxygenation, ventilation and perfusion in the baby. Correct and maintain a normal metabolic and acid-based balance. And thirdly, look and manage the uh, complications, if any. So what is the initial management in the NICU? Any baby, for that matter, requiring any sort of resuscitation at birth, that it may be a bag and mass ventilation or, of course, if it is requiring CPR or intubation or medications, those babies will be admitted definitely in NICU for post-resuscitation care. The nursing should be at least in a thermoneutral temperature with a skin temperature of 36.5 if the hypothermia devices are not available in the NICU. We should secure an IV line, of course, and fluids can be a bit restricted to begin with. That is, it may be two-third of the maintenance. The fluid bolus uh, is given if the capillary refill time is delayed, that is more than three seconds, or the blood pressure is low. Vitamin K has to be never forgotten, especially in such babies. 
because they are likely to develop coagulation problems. A stomach wash may be required in uh, the babies if at all there is too much meconium aspiration or there is a history of antepartum hemorrhage and the baby is likely to have swallowed maternal blood which can cause uh, later issues and vomiting. So clinically always monitor all the vital parameters, heart rate, RR, color, the capillary refill time, the SpO2, BP temperature. And I would add sugar also because it's considered as a you know, vital parameter in a newborn baby. So all the vitals are monitored plus the neurological status including tones, seizures, pupils, how conscious or active or alert the baby is, the sucking and swallowing are monitored. For the gut, of course, monitor the AG or abdominal circumference and the urine output is very, very important. Which tests can be done? The biochemical monitoring will include everything from blood gases to the sugar monitoring, regular screening of sugar, CBC and hematocrit to rule and maybe even sepsis screen to rule out any infection. Electrolytes, calcium, the BUN and creatinine, coagulation profile, the liver function test, and sometimes even CKMB, if at all you want to prove that there is cardiac or myocardial depression. Sepsis screen, why? Because we have to rule out in utero infection in such babies, which may be the cause of asphyxia, or sometimes acquired infection, which happens during resuscitation or invasive procedures. An X-ray test always to rule out any pneumothorax, malformation or cardiac enlargement has to be done. Specific investigations like neuroimaging may give us a certain idea or picture about the prognosis or the amount of damage which the baby is suffering from. So it may be a CT scan, quick CT scan, which will show us brain edema with small chinky or compressed ventricles or hemorrhage. This can be shown in a CT scan. An ultrasound, which is a bedside test, easily done, can be done in all such babies, which may also reveal small compressed ventricles and hemorrhage. And finally, of course, MRI, which we'll come with to later. Of course, remember, so except for sonography, the other neuroimaging may wait till the baby becomes hemodynamically stable, right? And EEG, of course, will uh, be a part of evaluation, especially if the baby is having seizures, right? Specifically, what are your goals or targets of specific management of these babies? Your temperature has to be maintained properly, ensure that they don't become hyperthermic at least. The perfusion has to be maintained. You can, for a full-term baby, maintain a mean BP of around 40 to 60 millimeters of mercury. Capillary refill time, like I already said, should be maintained less than three seconds. The oxygenation you have to maintain using oxygen, ventilation, etc. as per the need. The glucose should be between 70 to 110. Calcium levels also need to be monitored because they are also, calcium is also like an inotropic agent actually. So calcium should be between 9 to 11. And urine output, which is a very important parameter to be monitored, has to be more than 1 ml per kg per hour. Please ensure that uh, there is no metabolic acidosis or treat by bringing back the hemodynamic stability. Seizures, of course, you'll have to treat in such babies. First and foremost, remember, if a newborn has a seizure, always check the sugars, treat hypoglycemia if it is present, check for hypocalcemia and we give one calcium uh, bolus as well. And then if the seizures are still there, you can go for phenobarbitone. The loading doses are uh, noted below. I think uh, they are known to all, so I won't go into details. And phenytoin will be your second choice, of course. And levetiracetam has been shown to be effective and safe in newborn babies. Many people are using, but there are studies which are showing that phenobarbitone is still, you know, the uh, drug of choice generally in newborn babies. When to stop anticonvulsants, if you ask me? So, they may sometimes be stopped uh, at discharge, but if there are multiple seizures or if the baby is neurologically looking abnormal, or the EEG is abnormal, we will be continuing with the anticonvulsants for one month to three months or till we are sure that the EEG is normal and neurologically there are no sequelae in the baby. This is the uh, posture which I was talking about. 
and I wanted to show you that this baby is just lying limp, with, you know, with no flexion. His legs are also lying uh, like pithed frog like position on the bed. And this is an asphyxiated baby, in fact, showing the sign of central cyanosis. You can make out this baby is not pink, right? There is cyanosis visible, evidently. So now coming to neuroprotective strategies. What do we do? We receive such a baby who has asphyxia and we want to minimize the damage which has been done or to minimize the brain injury to such babies. One very effective technique, which I think you know all units should now practice is therapeutic hypothermia. This definitely reduces the risk of brain injury in an asphyxiated newborn. It can be of two types, of course, total body cooling and head cooling. The key point, I think the first point I would like to mention here itself is that we have to try and ensure that the TH or the therapeutic hypothermia is started within six hours after birth. So early recognition of the signs and symptoms of asphyxia is vital. Try to start hypothermia by six hours after birth. Of course, uh, central venous and arterial axis is ideal, if possible, before starting hypothermia. Which babies do you include for th uh, therapeutic hypothermia? Or which babies you can give this therapeutic hypothermia is that if the postmenstrual gestational age of the baby is 36 weeks or above, and the birth weight is more than or at least 2 kg, these babies you can give. There has to be some evidence of perinatal asphyxia, like a history of event like abruption or cord prolapse. The pH, which we already talked about, should be less than or equal to 7 with a base deficit or a base deficit, I would say, of more than 12 to 16 millimeters, millimoles per liter in the cord blood gas <coughs> or ABG within one hour of life. The 10-minute abgar less than or equal to 5 and ventilation started at birth and needed for at least 10 minutes. These all can be inclusion criteria. And finally, of course, signs and symptoms of moderate to severe HIE, evidenced by the mainly clinical examination, like abnormal tone, abnormal neonatal reflexes, or seizures, or an EEG recording, <coughs> which is abnormal for uh, at least 20 minutes. Which babies? you may not consider to give hypothermia, that is which babies are to be excluded. So of course, if there is any lethal chromosomal abnormality present, that is a baby's probably uh, already having some lethal problem and is going to definitely not survive. Or there is some severe congenital abnormality or CNS anomaly <coughs> or complex congenital cyanotic heart disease. These babies cannot be given hypothermia. Of course, if there is a significant bleeding disorder already or significant bleeding diathesis evident in the baby, we should avoid hypothermia. And lastly, in major intracranial hemorrhage, which is already present in the baby, such babies cannot be given hypothermia. Just to show you some photos or pictures of the various devices which are available for therapeutic hypothermia. <coughs> The first one is called blanket troll or critical in which a proper machine regulates the temperature of the baby. You can set the alarm limits and the baby is wrapped up nicely in a, a specialized blanket which gives proper cooling to the entire body of the baby. Next one is Mira Cradle uh, which is a more simplified version okay, and quite commonly used. The third one is only a head cooling cap, which looks something like this. And the Tecotherm Neo, which is again another device in which the baby is wrapped up in a blanket with the machine regulating the baby's body temperature. So do you think that if you just don't have any of these devices and you just keep the warmer off, can you do hypothermia? The baby will start cold. Five minutes. Sorry, yeah, okay. Five Five yeah. minutes. Yeah, sure. So no, the temperature is not under precise control, right? If you just keep the baby under your normal warmer and keep the warmer off, 
the baby may turn too cold you are not controlling the baby's temperature there is no control over the baby's hypothermia so we cannot do that the automated devices pro pre provide precise control on this cooling uh, of course rewarming is also very important which i'll tell you quickly now and some units do use low cost uh, equipments like ice gel packs which i again think is not a properly monitored thing so how does this hypothermia work actually a cooling cap or a blanket is placed on the newborn to lower the body temperature to around 33.5 degrees celsius this is maintained for 72 hours this decrease in temperature lowers the metabolic rate and the brain cells and tissues are then able to recover because the metabolism is low the tissues recover slowing or stopping the additional brain damage to the baby so this is a cooling cap whereas it's a flexible cap that runs cold water or coolant through the channels in the cap and this allow draws the heat from the baby's body and reduces the temperature of the body and brain and whole body cooling the infant is placed on a cooling blanket naked with except for a diaper and this entire blanket will lower the temperature of the baby this is the way a mira cradle works so a normal mattress is there then another conduction mattress then three units which are you know charged and crate kept under the warmer of the mira cradle so monitoring quickly or always monitor core temperature continuously document it every 15 minutes till the goal of 33.5 is achieved then do it hourly use either esophageal or rectal thermometers for this and of course monitor during the rewarming also every hour respiratory wise you should look at abgs and lactate at regular intervals 4 hours 8 hours 12 hours 24 48 and 72 hours intervals the cardiovascular of course vital signs have to be monitored the fluid electrolyte balance and the uh, child is usually kept nbm during hypothermia all electrolytes glucose calcium have to be done at baseline and then once daily at least you may give the baby tpn if required because the baby is nbm the sodium may be maintained at a high normal level around 140 to avoid cerebral edema the pt ptt inr fibrinogen and platelets are done once daily please maintain platelets above 1 lakh during hypothermia and remember such babies may need some sedation to avoid shivering you know because we are giving hypothermia to the baby watch out for sepsis always give antibiotics if required and full eeg may be done at 24 hours and 12 hours after rewarming a cranial sonography is also a must i think in all these babies and mri brain only if hemodynamically stable baby and no seizures ongoing after rewarming so the mri is usually planned after rewarming but usually if you may do it in the first 1 to 7 days of life you may look for early hypoxic ischemic injury so when you stop the cooling it is at the end of 72 hours and the rewarming is very important as well it is at a rate of 0.5 degrees celsius every hour till the baby reaches 36.5 degrees celsius so this will take an average of 6 hours to rewarm the baby completely so hypothermia done right can save a lot of babies from brain injury do remember and try to practice in all your units finally coming to the last two slides just the outcome of hie we should all know that uh the babies may have developmental delays epilepsy or seizure disorder cerebral palsy cognitive problems motor skill development delays or neurodevelopmental delays the overall mortality or prognosis is 20% mortality is there neurodevelopmental sequelae are present in nearly one third of the babies cp may be present in 5 to 10% of these babies and uh, whereas you know uh, stage wise if you see stage 1 hi usually turn out to be fine stage 2 hi around 20 to 30% or 20 to 40% babies will have some sequelae whereas stage 3 hi is the worst half of these babies die and the remaining half all have some neurodevelopmental sequelae so how to make out this outcome is just that there is failure to establish respiration by 5 minutes the gar score of 3 or less at 5 minutes 
seizures within 12 hours if they happen that indicates a poor prognosis refractory seizures going on after one two or three anticonvulsants requiring a uh, sedation or paralysis may be a bad prognostic factor no feeds established by one week of life and finally a very abnormal low voltage eeg or no sleep wake cycling in the eeg by 72 to 96 hours and a very abnormal neuroimaging of course these are all the poor prognostic factors so the i think the take home message should be always to prevent asphyxia rather than trying to treat it by doing a regular antenatal assessment antenatal checkups high risk approach anticipate complications during labor timely interventions like cesarean as when as and when required and then timely referral to a center where the management will be proper tertiary care unit is there fetal monitoring is done and where maternal complications can be handled properly thank you so much Thank you, Dr. Asmita. That was a very wonderful and clear presentation. Thank you. Um, yeah. So to just quickly summarize for everyone, so number one point would be, you know, differentiate between neonatal depression and asphyxia. Just because a baby doesn't cry, that you know, that doesn't mean that there is perinatal asphyxia. Perinatal asphyxia should, like you mentioned in the talk, should have evidence of organ injury, anaerobic metabolism, and acidosis. And the most important is encephalopathy. So documenting the staging of encephalopathy and grading and you know treating accordingly is very important. Second thing is there is a critical time window. So once it is diagnosed, we should understand that within six hours in the current era, there is a time window for hypothermia. So if the baby is born at a center where it is not available, timely referral is crucial. Also, if the baby comes diagnosing quickly and starting treatment is important for the long-term outcome. Clinical management lab monitoring includes preventing further, you know, issues that affect the brain, like a low blood pressure, low sugars, having a secondary infection, prolonged seizures. So all these things are additional injuries to the asphyxia that has already happened. So we should be very careful in preventing all these. So these are the other brain protective strategies. And the most important brain protective or the evidence-based strategy is therapeutic hypothermia. So the most important thing for that is core temperature monitoring. So you're cooling the baby externally, but monitoring the rectal temperature. So the core temperature should be 33.52 or 33 to 34. So that is most important. And that is a very intensive thing. It needs one is to one nursing and monitoring. So the cooling baby is like driving an F1 car where you need all the helmet, you know, all the engineers, everybody to sort of be around the baby and monitor. Everything can go wrong with cooling. So that needs additional monitoring. And then like correctly mentioned, prevention is always much, much safer and better than cure. So in the current uh, obstetric practice, it should be a very rare event that a bad asphyxia has happened. So thanks for the lucid talk, Dr. Smita. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anish, uh, for summarizing that so well. And uh, so uh, so we had uh, wonderful presentations, both by Dr. Asmita, uh, very lucid, and uh, you helped in understanding this topic, complex topic, in a very uh, simple way. Um, yes, now this cooling is also become a standard of care and i think most of the units do have uh, cooling uh, hypothermia uh, cooling blankets and uh, some kind of system sometimes it can be very expensive uh, so in resource limited setting i have a question for you that any uh, anything which can be done for like passive cooling or where uh, because this technology is like high cost so anything can be done in resource limited settings for cooling so the basic requirement for cooling in low resource setting still is rectal temperature monitoring. So I think as long as we are monitoring the core temperature, we are okay to use uh, Mira Cradle or you know some unconventional cooling strategy. The problem happens when that core temperature monitoring is not there and other complications happen like infection, hypotension, hypoglycemia, sepsis. So I think all these other parameters need to be tightly watched. And if there is otherwise a rectal temperature probe, which gives a continuous temperature monitoring. So the fluctuations in temperature are actually worse than cooling a baby. So rather having a temperature which is constant at 36, 36.5 is much better than a fluctuating temperature that goes up and down. So as long as there is a continuous temperature monitoring, uh, you know, reasonable nursing care that is around the baby, other uh, therapies like Mira Cradle and, you know, a non-conventional things may be uh, useful. Right, right. Or as you said, uh, timely referral to a higher center where cooling facilities are available. Yeah. yeah. 
and uh, thank you thank you dr om prakash for that uh, for a very interactive and impressive uh, presentation on blood uh, uh, blood component therapy um, i think uh, as rightly said uh, we need to watch for the phlebotomy losses and track them especially in premature babies, babies because even small small volumes uh, can have a lot of effect on the cardiovascular and hemodynamic system so with this i would like to thank dr asmita dr om prakash dr anish uh, for taking out your time and giving such uh, wonderful presentations and also i would like to thank dr jaisal for supporting this program and we hope to have a similar uh, program uh, in another two weeks where we'll have two new topics and uh, we'll discuss uh, two important topics from nursing perspective so thank you everyone thank you everyone and thanks a lot so with this uh, i'll close the program uh, just one minute are there any questions from the audience so i don't see any questions from the audience in the chat box um, so from here we'll end the session thank you so much thank you dr ashish it was a pleasure thank you anish and om prakash